Hello, and welcome to the Data Engineering Podcast, the show about modern data management. Introducing Rudderstack Profiles. Rudderstack Profiles takes the SaaS guesswork and SQL grunt work out of building complete customer profiles so you can quickly ship actionable, enriched data to every downstream team. You specify the customer traits, then Profiles runs the joins and computations for you to create complete customer profiles. Get all of the details and try the new product today at dataengineeringpodcast.com slash Rudderstack. You shouldn't have to throw away the database to build with fast-changing data. You should be able to keep the familiarity of SQL and the proven architecture of cloud warehouses, but swap the decades-old batch computation model for an efficient incremental engine to get complex queries that are always up to date. With Materialize, you can. It's the only true SQL streaming database built from the ground up to meet the needs of modern data products. Whether it's real-time dashboarding and analytics, personalization and segmentation, or automation and alerting, Materialize gives you the ability to work with fresh, correct, and scalable results, all on a familiar SQL interface. Go to dataengineeringpodcast.com slash materialize today to get two weeks free. Your host is Tobias Macy, and today I'm interviewing Dustin Dorsey and Cameron Sear about how to design your DBT projects. So Dustin, can you start by introducing yourself? Yeah, thanks, Tobias. Um, so my name is Dustin Dorsey. I am a systems and data architect at Biobot Analytics, which is a wastewater epidemiology company based out of Cambridge, Massachusetts. have been working with data for over 15 years at this point, have designed and built tons of data warehouses using a lot of different technologies. And DBT is one of the tools that I've been using the past few years and something that I absolutely love. And I'm excited to be able to get on here and talk about it. And Cameron. Thanks, Tobias. Cameron Sear. I'm a I'm a staff data engineer at a company called Breezeway. So we build a property management software for short-term rental property managers, like Airbnb, Verbo, that kind of thing. Um, I've been in been in the data space since the beginning of my career. While well, my career hasn't been extremely long and robust at this point, I, I started off in financial sector and have changed around quite a bit since then. But yeah, DBT is one of my favorite tools in the in the modern data stack, if you will, and excited to. Uh, have our chat today about it. And going back to you, Dustin, do you remember how you first got started working in data? Yeah, so it's a it's actually a pretty interesting story that it's got some funny points in it. So I didn't go to school for tech. Um, I actually went to a Bible college and studied theology, and here I am. At the time that I got into tech, I was working for a vending company and absolutely had the worst luck ever with this job. So my job was driving around stocking vending machines. During the course of working there, of no fault of my own, I blew multiple truck engines. I caught a truck on fire. I lost my drive shaft on the interstate and hit a semi truck. Um, I took the awning out at a local hospital. And every day it felt like there was something crazy bad that was happening. And I was like, I'm becoming a liability to these guys. I just need to, I need to find another job. And thankfully at the time I had a family member who was working for a company that was looking for entry level tech person. And so he reached out to him and he was able to get me in the door, basically just doing monitoring. So it's like, hey, we just want you to look at these alerts and tell us when there's a problem so someone that knows tech can go in and fix it. And while in that role, we didn't have a lot of UI tools to troubleshoot issues. We had to do it through the database layer. So I began learning from them and that was kind of my first exposure to data. And from there, my career has kind of taken off and have gone through a lot of different iterations. I kind of got my original kind of data start as a DBA. And then that's kind of gone into data architecture, into data leadership, into enterprise architecture, which is where I am now. And Cameron, do you remember how you got started working in data? Yeah. So coming out of high school, actually, I was working for a, just an insurance company and I was, I was selling insurance. And quite frequently, I was trying to opt, I found myself trying to optimize my my sales pipeline, like, oh, what are the, you know, how could I do this more efficiently, right? Constantly trying to understand, okay, these are the types of businesses that work better for me. I became shamelessly today, I came became like a Excel guru at the time. And it's like, oh, there's got to be a better way to do this stuff. And so I started researching and ended up in uh, going to college for business analytics. So I got a business analytics degree. Coming out of college, I start working for a bank in Texas, like one of the biggest regional banks in Texas, and I'm working there as a data analyst. And so I start getting to do the, the analytics stuff that I was really enjoying in the past. But as I start working for this enterprise level organization, I'm like, oh, there's 
I'm starting to experience uh, maybe some data issues, right? There's a lot of red tape on things in the banking industry, as you can imagine. Um, and so sometimes technology doesn't grow as quickly as you might, you might want outside, or you experience uh, maybe issues accessing data or issues trying to build out a new data set. Things aren't always documented great. And so it's like, what are the roles that I could get into to, to do better, right? I mean, I felt somewhat limited as a data analyst. And so I started researching and learned about the data engineering position. And I was like, oh, this is exactly what I'm looking for. And dove headfirst into everything data engineering and everything under the sun. And that's how I ended up where I am today. And now bringing us around to the topic at hand where we're going to talk through DBT, how to use it, some of the ways that people can scale their usage of it, some of the tech debt issues that might come up. Before we get into all of that, what was each of your path to actually getting involved with and adopting DBT as a utility for your toolkit? Yeah, I'll go ahead and start with this. So for for me, like a lot of my early part of my career, probably the first decade of my career, was spent pretty heavy in the Microsoft realm. So working with Microsoft services, Azure and on-prem Microsoft services. And a lot of my background is in healthcare, which traditionally kind of more so leans a little heavier into the Microsoft world. I had an opportunity to leave a role to go work for a startup company a few years ago. And the startup company had already landed on what their infrastructure was going to be and everything was built with an AWS. And all of my experience coming from Microsoft world, I was just coming out of a role where I had built an, a warehouse um, for a large company using Synapse Analytics. I was now kind of being moved over into or moving over into working for an AWS shop where obviously Synapse Analytics, which is a Microsoft product, isn't supported on Synapse, on AWS. So wasn't able to use that. And we had a big need of needing to build a data warehouse. We needed to centralize data. We needed to build analytics on top of it, et cetera. So the cloud tools that I was comfortable using were an option. So when we have started evaluating other tools, I knew I wanted something that would allow me to use my SQL skill set because I love writing SQL. I've written SQL for a lot of years and it was something that I wanted to be able to use. So when we started looking at and evaluating tools, DBT continually rose to the top of something that we were interested in and packaged with other vendors that we ultimately ended up selecting, um, which was a Snowflake and Fivetran, which worked really, really well with DBT. It became pretty a pretty natural fit for us on what to use. And since doing that, like being able to kind of go back and look at what I've built in the past, where I've used SQL to build transformations, but using things more like store procedures, and then using other tools to orchestrate those, like DBT took that to a whole nother level of having so much of what all those added components we were needing to build with store procedures, we now were all kind of integrated into a single tool. So it was very natural for me to land in it. And since I've kind of landed there, I'm like, why wasn't I using this the whole time that I was building things? But yeah, that is, that's ultimately kind of how I ended up on, on using DBT. It's just a shift of role and having to step out of my comfort zone. And Cameron, what was your path to adoption for DBT? Yeah. So when I started learning DBT or learning of DBT, it actually came from uh, just a podcast I was listening to. So this was back in 2019 is when I first started learning about DBT and they were still a very early company at that time. I don't think DBT cloud was even a product yet. So it was all the, all the open source solution at the moment, but I kept hearing it on, on the same podcast. Like they would bring it up almost every episode for a while. It felt like, and they would talk about things like data lineage, data quality, introducing software engineering, best practices to your, to your workflows. And at the time I was still a data analyst. Right. And so I was a guy that had, uh, just a file on my on my laptop that had you know 150 different SQL scripts in it that I would run whenever somebody needed an analysis done, right? So I was hearing these things and I was like, wow, that would be really nice for my day to day work. And so I was still in the the banking industry at the time, right? So as a low level data analyst, my odds of getting that implemented at the organization were slim to none. But I as a as an individual wanted to go learn about it, so started researching it online, reading through all their documentation. Yeah, and like just really went heads down on it and experienced 
amazing things, right? Just like Dustin, I was also using sword procedures at the time to manage objects in my database and my data warehouse and uh, the ability to be able to promote things through environments and whatnot in your data warehouse using DBT is uh, one of the biggest reasons that I was influenced into it, right? And being able to test data quality, like another thing that is absolutely amazing to me. Since then, I've built uh, three data warehouses from the ground up using DBT to manage all the transformation logic and would never go back to using stored procedures if, if I could and have yet to have a reason to do so. That that podcast you mentioned wouldn't happen to be this one, would it? It wasn't this one. I can say the name of it if that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, it was the Analytics Power Hour. And, yeah. I, I was just curious because I was, was wondering what time did I actually do my first interview on DBT and it was in 2019, so... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> And it does come up quite frequently in this show as well. But no, I'm, I'm always happy to help uh, promote other people who are working in the community to spread the knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's hard to not bring the topic up in the in the data management space, right? It just it has become such a quintessential tool in the tech stack, in my opinion, that if you have had the opportunity to use it, once you get it, you just get it. And it's hard to look back the other way after you've used it. Absolutely. Particularly coming from a data engineering perspective where you want everything to be reliable and repeatable and there is a source of truth that doesn't happen to live on somebody's laptop. DBT just is a natural fit and a natural extension to the rest of the ecosystem. Yeah, absolutely. And so for people who are newcomers to dbt or for people who are maybe bootstrapping a brand new dbt project for a new company or a new initiative what are some of the common challenges that they experience when they're first getting that initial dbt project up and running and off the ground yeah i mean for me it was just figuring out how to get started so and it's part of the reason why we actually wrote the book that we wrote that we ended up writing was when I was new, kind of coming up to speed on DBT and trying to figure it out, the documentation was great on teaching you how to do it. Where it lacked, in my opinion, was how to practically apply it. And so it's how do I take this information that they're giving me on how to use this and how do I build something that's scalable and maintainable and reliable that I can do? So I think just figuring out where to get started was probably one of the biggest challenges that I had just because there wasn't a lot of resources to help guide you through that. So my experience was a lot of trial and error. So me and Cameron worked together in a previous role in which we were standing up a warehouse. We stood up DBT, at least some of the bones of it before, before Cameron had started. And there was a lot of trial and error and kind of figuring it out. And eventually it's like, well, look, we're just going to have to start creating some structure here and we'll adapt as we learn and make some mistakes. And eventually we kind of landed on how we are going to structure our project to best work for us. But yeah, I think that was a big one for me. Cameron, I'll kick it over to you. I'm, I'm sure you have additional thoughts there as well. Yeah, for sure. I think that, you know, the getting into a DBT project, there's it's kind of twofold for me for teams that have never used it before. The first challenge being the technical perspective, right? And so if we think about DBT Core as the open source solution first, uh, you have to worry about managing the infrastructure to actually run the project. And there are there's obviously alternatives to that. You can use DBT Cloud to, to host everything for you, which would recommend most of the time, unless you have a really good team of data engineers or DevOps folks that can help you manage the infrastructure. So that's one piece of it, right? Getting that set up. Now, I don't want to scare anybody away using DBT Core if that's the route you go. Like The infrastructure to run a DBT project is it's pretty straightforward, right? I mean, it's a very lightweight Python package at the end of the day. And so you could just easily run it in a Docker container and then put that Docker container out wherever you choose to, right? Whether that be ECS or just running it on a EC2 machine, however you decide to do that. But the other piece is the strategic perspective. So if you think about larger organizations or someone outside of the startup world, they're typically already going to have a data warehouse built, right? And they're going to maybe be moving from Maybe they're moving from, say, Teradata to Snowflake. And as part of that, they want to move all of their Teradata stored procedures into Snowflake. But while doing that, migrating all the stored procedure transformations into DBT. And so just having a plan on how to do that is of the utmost importance, for me, in my opinion, right? Because going from a stored procedure to DBT is not just a copy-paste solution. Uh, 
because of the fact that in DBT, you no longer have to worry about managing things like DDL or DML, right? Everything, at least from the SQL transformation perspective, is just a select statement. And so having, you know, it might have to rethink the way you do things a lot, right? And in the stored procedure world, you lose, you use uh, temp tables a lot, right? And so you've got to think about how to break those out into different DBT models. So it's just a mindset shift. And so you have to have some sort of strategy going into that so that you don't make mistakes or just get overwhelmed. And then the, the, the migration just ends up failing as a whole. Yeah. And one thing to add to that too, Cameron, like it's a shift in your thinking too, of how you're building models when you're only building models using a select command. So this took me a little bit of, to, of getting used to of coming from largely kind of using like store procedures in place before because you're running upstarts, you're running merges, you're running a lot of different commands with those. And when you go to DBT, you don't have the option of running those or you do have the option of running those, but not like a straightforward way in terms of how you're building your models. So everything is run as a select and you're like, what in the world? Like it takes a little bit of getting used to and you have to kind of, you have to rely on some of the configurations and DBT to actually be able to basically kind of maintain that upstart merge logic. Because what you need to do with the data doesn't change. Like you still need to be able to incrementally load data. You still need to be able to create slowly changing dimensions. You still need to be able to do that stuff. But the mindset of, okay, I have to write this in a select command takes a little bit of getting used to, especially when you come from some of these other um, ways of doing things. Yeah, absolutely. But once you once you do get that mindset shift, it is, it is immensely easier, right? I mean, if you think right. about, I haven't, I can't, recall the last time I actually had to write a merge statement and had to deal with any of that, right? And now I just, oh, I need to incrementally load a table into my, my final data warehouse model. Like, okay, cool. I just configure it in the DBT project as an incremental model, tell it what the unique key is and, and we're set, right? But yeah, there is definitely that shift of uh, thinking from going from stored procedures and actually writing all of that logic yourself to just, okay, I'm going to trust that DBT can handle this and and it does, which is great. Data lakes are notoriously complex. For data engineers who battle to build and scale high-quality data workflows on the data lake, Starburst powers petabyte-scale SQL analytics fast at a fraction of the cost of traditional methods so that you can meet all of your data needs, ranging from AI to data applications to complete analytics. Trusted by teams of all sizes, including Comcast and DoorDash, Starburst is a data lake analytics platform that delivers the adaptability and flexibility a lakehouse ecosystem promises. And Starburst does all of this on an open architecture, with first-class support for Apache Iceberg, Delta Lake, and Hoodie, so you always maintain ownership of your data. Want to see Starburst in action? Go to dataengineeringpodcast.com slash Starburst and get $500 in credits to try Starburst Galaxy today. The easiest and fastest way to get started using Trino. In terms of prior experience working either as an analyst or as a software engineer, how does that maybe influence the ways that people will approach that initial setup of a DBT project or any areas where they may be focus their attention and possibly overlook some of the features that DBT has built in that will help them get their work done that is maybe not as obvious as it could or should be. Yeah, I think that one is also kind of twofold depending on what your experience is, right? So if you're coming from an analytics background or a software engineering background, the adoption of DBT tends to be extremely easy, right? Because uh, until last year, all of your transformations were written in SQL. And now you can also write Python transformations, but for either of those cohorts of folks, whether you be an analyst or a software engineer, you know, data-focused software engineer, at least, those are the two languages that you're most likely going to have uh, very robust skills in, right? And so being able to come in and quickly start providing value by by building DBT models, the, the time to value there is very low. Where I see maybe these two folks using features of DBT that is either overutilized or underutilized, I would say are macros. So people come in strictly from the analytics background, like say a data analyst or something of that nature, I feel like macros get underutilized. Whereas I've worked with some folks that came from software engineering backgrounds and they want to put everything into a macro and it's like to a, to a fault, right? And you know, it's like the classic over uh, over abstracting concepts and 
it ends up just adding additional confusion, right? And so you have to try try to find the right balance in there. And if you can, it makes things all the more smooth. Yeah, and when you're getting started with it, you kind of you kind of hit on this, Cameron. I mean, if you know SQL, you're going to be able to utilize DBT. Like it's a pretty low entry, low learning curve. SQL is really the only skill that I would say is a must have, at least being able to understand the basic structure of a select statement to get started. But other skills that are absolutely going to help you along the way, and you hit on these, Cameron, Jinja, Python, understanding YAML, so all of your configuration is done in YAML, having a good understanding of source control. Some of the level of understanding you need will depend if you're using DBT Core or using DBT Cloud. Um, if you're using Cloud, you just need to really understand just the concepts um, associated with it. And then the last one, which is the, the biggest one, and it's actually one where I think one of the biggest issues that people have with using dbt is thinking about their data model and data modeling and this is a very very underrated skill in my opinion when it comes to using dbt because dbt makes it so easy to get started and to be able to use it that you know you can go in and you can start creating a model in a matter of seconds without actually thinking through like okay what does my end state look like and it's very easy for your project just to go complete chaos and bonkers when you have thousands of models running because everyone's just turning it into the wild, wild west and not working against the plan. So having some experience, at least someone who's working in your project, um, have experience doing some data modeling, I think is a really crucial skill that's going to save you a lot of a lot of headache down the road. There's a lot of consulting companies who are making a lot of money off of companies today in their DBT environments because they didn't actually model their data before they started it and they just kind of let their analysts go crazy. Yeah, and Dustin, you mentioned the you mentioned the skill of YAML. YAML is so easy to understand, but anybody that has worked in a DBT project of any scale can probably relate to the like how much time you actually spend in YAML files, right? Cuz you're in there, you write your documentation in YAML files. Uh, you do your testing in YAML files. You do all of your project configuration in YAML files. It's a great way to do it, right? And it, it makes things very simple to move between environments again, to do testing and documentation, all of this stuff. But uh, the amount of time you spend in there is something that I underestimated as a, as a newcomer to DBT. And I've, I've learned, you know, better ways to do it, right? Over time, there's, there's DBT packages that you can use to help you like automatically generate some of your YAML files. So you're not sitting there writing the, the things that become redundant and then you can actually write the specifics about documentation and whatnot and, and specific tests. But yeah, that, that was something that I certainly underestimated the amount of time I'd be spending in was, uh, was YAML. Yeah. And it's all great until you forget which level of indentation you're supposed to be working at. <laughs> yes. Oh my goodness. That's so true. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, is this, are we doing two, two spaces? Are we doing a tab? Are we doing four spaces? It, it all it all gets uh, pretty tricky. Fortunately, there are you know YAML validation tools out there, but um, yeah, it can become a headache very quickly. Well, e even that can be a bit of a foot gun because it might be valid YAML, but it's not actually valid semantically because of what you're trying to convey. Where it will parse as valid YAML, but that documentation string that you thought you were adding to one attribute is actually on a different one. <laughs> yeah, very true. Yeah. And that gets even that gets even more true. You talk about the documentation string if you're actually, you know, like abstracting your documentation up into markdown files and then trying to use it throughout your YAML files, that can that can become a headache as well. Well, very powerful, but a headache if you're not careful. And as you mentioned, Dustin, briefly, you both worked together on writing a book to encapsulate some of these hard learned lessons uh, about DBT and using it for real world production use cases. What motivated you to actually invest that time and effort and how much do you regret it now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, great question. So yeah, as I mentioned before, I mean, we, we wrote the book as as a resource for a practical application to DBT. We felt that a lot of the documentation and the resources that existed did not really give you a blueprint for how to practically apply it. And we felt there was even a bigger gap when it came to data engineers specifically. DBT markets pretty heavily to the data analyst. And while I don't know this for a fact, I imagine a lot of their businesses coming through, folks that are data analysts are getting DBT into their organizations. And that's where they push it to. But yeah, we don't feel like there, we didn't feel like there was a lot 
like directed toward like data engineers. And I think some of this has to do with where the money is made. A lot of data engineers are capable and comfortable using DBT core, which obviously DBT labs does not make any money off of. Um, whereas a lot of analysts don't necessarily have those skill sets. They want to be able to use the IDE and they want to be able to use the cloud functionality. So they market a lot of their more, a lot of their materials toward that. So a lot of their documentation doesn't really, it kind of gives you structure and it gives you some tips along the way of building a warehouse, but it doesn't really kind of give you a blueprint of how to use their tool to go in and build a warehouse. What we wanted to do with this book, we wanted to pretty much walk through every part of every folder or every part of your DBT project and show how practically apply it and how you can actually build a data warehouse and build an, an efficient and effective data warehouse using this tool, because we think it's an incredible tool for it. In fact, it's one of my favorite tools out of my 15 years of using tools, one of my favorite tools that I've ever used. So we really wanted to be able to demonstrate that. And we, at the end of the day, both me and Cameron were engineers first. And so we wrote the book from an engineering perspective. So it's got trial and errors that we've gone through. It's got lessons learned that of uh, things that we've learned throughout it. And so we thought it was going to be a yeah super helpful book out to the community and for people just as another resource. Yeah, and I'll expand on that a little bit too. That it it is not the only resource to learn DBT, right? Like you can you can learn from the documentation. I mean, that's primarily how I learned DBT. But yeah, to Dustin's point, I had to piece things together and kind of learn my own way. While there are there's also videos out there though you can watch right you know I, I know DBT has some courses published themselves there's some great Coursera and Udemy courses out there as well that you can learn how to use DBT from beginning to end um, but selfishly like I'm I'm a bibliophile right I love reading books and I there wasn't a book on DBT and so when Dustin came up with this opportunity that we could write the book I I mean I jumped at it immediately right because of the fact that there was nothing in the market for it. There was no book on DBT that shows you how to go from beginning to end. And while reading documentation and videos are great, sometimes I just wish I could pick the book up and go go and reference something very quickly, right? And maybe that's a little old fashioned of me or, or whatever, but that's just that's just the way I like to do things sometimes. Just, you know, an extra tool in the tool belt to help you learn, right? Right. Yeah. And as far as the misery that you mentioned when it comes to writing books, so when we started writing this book, I had literally just come off of finishing a project of writing my first book, which was pro database migration to Azure. So totally different topic. And the publisher had reached out and saw that I was presenting at a conference on DBT. And it's like, Hey, would you like to write a book on DBT? And I'm like, no, I don't. It sucked the first time. Why would I want to do it again? And, um, I thought about it some more. As Cameron mentioned, there wasn't a resource on the market for it. And the idea of being one of the first to hit the market on it, we weren't actually the first. There was one other that got came out right before us, but at the time we didn't know that. I reached out to Cameron. I knew Cameron loved DBT as well. And I'm like, hey man, I'm there's no way in the world I'm writing another a full book. Like I don't have time for it. I just spent a year writing this other one to go right back into this. And Cameron was super excited about it and convinced me. And so we ended up writing it um, and going through it. And if you've ever written a book before, or even if you ever decide you think you want to write a book. It's great with getting through that first chapter and you're like, oh man, this is great. Great content feels good. And then you get to that first chapter and you're like, oh God, we have nine more of these to write. And then it starts, the misery starts sitting in when it's a beautiful weekend and your wife and kids are outside playing or going somewhere. And you're like, man, I'd really love to be doing that, but I'm sitting at my computer typing. And not only that, you're writing about the same stuff you're working on throughout the week. So your work week just feels like it never ends. Um, so definitely challenging. It feels good when it's completed and you're super excited and super proud of it, but it is a very hard process. But you do it so you can be rich, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the royalties are, are amazing <laughs> <laughs> on books, that's for sure. Yeah. So may, we um we get a nice dinner, what, Cameron, nice dinner at the Red Lobster? <laughs> <laughs> something like that um no i mean it is a huge time commitment though to to write a book on any on any subject right i mean whether it be a technical topic or you know fiction nonfiction, what have you something that i never thought i would experience right i mean if i go back to 
my high school and college days. I was the I was the guy that wanted to put the bare minimum effort into any essay I ever had to write. And so uh, the the idea of a book, you know, five years ago, the idea that I would be a published author would I, I would not believe it. There's no way. Uh, but yeah, if you're passionate about something, if you have enough passion about it, you can make it happen. And DBT is that like is that for me, right? And at least in my professional career. It is the thing that I have enough passion about to be able to write a, an entire book about, right? I mean, I mean, I can't take the whole credit, right? Obviously, Dustin's here too, but between the two of us, we were able to to put out an entire book on the t- on the subject. And in the process of going through the exercise of writing a book, figuring out what is the flow, what are the details, what are the core elements that we're going to include? I'm curious, what are some of the aspects of the DBT project, ways to use DBT, some of its features that you learned in the process that you previously had not had occasion to experiment with? The product itself is extremely extensive. And I knew that going into writing the book because we we lay out you know, each chapter in the book is very more or less dedicated to a, a component or a feature of the product. Uh, but once you actually get in there and you start writing about, say you're writing about macros, you start thinking of every way you could use a macro. And, and you don't normally do that in your day-to-day work, right? Because you just sit down, you have a problem to solve, and you solve that problem using some feature of the product. Whereas when you're writing a book, you just sit there and you contemplate every single possibility where you might use a macro, for example. And so then how do you actually choose what what you're going to write about? And so I don't know that I necessarily learned a ton about the features of the product. I was fairly familiar with the features of the product at the time. But starting to think through all of the different use cases is what, what really put it into perspective for me. And so the lesson to take away there is that with any tool and in, in any facet, right? But like, you don't have to try to learn the entire thing to start gaining value from it. And hopefully that's, the, you know, hopefully any resource out there for learning DBT, whether it be our book or, or some videos or just reading the documentation, you can understand that and you can go, okay, great. I need to learn this feature because I need to implement it in what I'm working on in my day-to-day right now. And that, that is the thing that, that really got set into perspective to me. Again, it's just the, the breadth of the product. Yeah, I'll echo that, Cameron. I'm kind of kind of the same boat for me. There were definitely features as we were going through writing it that I didn't know exist. I learned a lot going through the process and definitely I'm much better at DBT than I was before I started. But I think when we got to the end of the book and we were starting to wrap up and we looked at how much content we had on paper and even going back and looking like all additional content that we could add it, which may come in a V2, like we were at 400 pages worth of content to on this product. And I had at the beginning and you have no idea, like oh, we can write 400 pages of content on this product because it so, so many aspects of it just felt so simple, but to Cameron's point, the breadth of the product and how vast it is, there's so many considerations and there's so many things to take into account that, yeah, it was, it was eye opening when we got to the end of just how much content was there and just how much more that we could have probably added to it. Yeah, Dustin, wasn't our original estimate on the book something like 200 pages? We we're like, oh, we told the publisher, I think we'll be able to write about 200 pages about this. And so it kind of goes back to that Brett thing when we start when we sat down and started actually writing, things got very verbose very quickly. Yeah, absolutely. And through that exercise of having to think through every detail of the product and possible ways that it could get get used, has that shifted the ways that you actually apply it in your day-to-day work? I don't think for me, I think it's still, I think I still look at it the same way that I use, I still use it the same way now that I used it when I started. I don't think it changed my perspective a whole lot. Cameron, I'll defer to you if. Yeah, it didn't, it didn't change my perspective about how I use the product. But what did change my perspective is the frequency at which I stay up to date on the new features of the product. Um, so, you know, before writing the book, I, I didn't I didn't know what version of DBT was the most recent, and you know, I didn't have to worry about that kind of stuff or what was involved in every release of DBT. But, you know, going into the book, I was attempting to stay aware of all of these new features because if it made sense to try to write about it, we wanted to, right? But there were even things that we opted not to write about because they were such new features. And that's that's where the perspective changed for me is just staying more up to date on all of the new features of the product and, and yeah. thinking through ways that we might actually 
work that into, you know, V2 of the book, like Dustin mentioned, because there are things that we didn't even talk about because they were so green. Uh, just a couple of examples are like the semantic layer. They were going, you know, DBT was going through an entire revamping of their semantic layer at the time, like as we were writing. And so we opted not to write about it at all because it, we didn't want to publish the book and then it'd be irrelevant immediately, right? Another one is the DBT mesh. Like that was a, a feature that was very, very green as we were writing the book. And so we opted not to write about it too extensively. I believe we mentioned it, but just more as a, hey, it's there in case you're interested type kind of thing. Yeah. And just to pull back the curtain a little bit on the process. And this, I think is true with most books that get written. And we were very cognizant of this as we were writing the book. From the time that you finish writing the book to the time that it goes into print is about four or five months. There's a pretty big gap there between that. So as Cameron mentioned, um, even though the book came out while some of these things were announced, we had actually finished writing it months prior before it actually ended up coming out. So we tried to take that into account when we were deciding on what to include and whatnot. Now that the book has been published and as you continue to use DBT in your day to day and you're more, I guess, meta aware of the tool that you're using and maybe how other people are using it. Uh, I'm curious how that has caused you to maybe reflect on the broader ecosystem that DBT has helped to generate in the form of analytics engineering as a job description and a profession. And I'm wondering what you see as being the net outcome of that trend towards analytics engineering being a discrete role. Is it net positive, net negative, net zero? I'm just wondering kind of what are some of the larger ramifications of the potential that DBT has unlocked in the ecosystem? Yeah, I think that I think that DBT has unlocked time to value for analytics by, I mean, I don't have an actual measurement here, but I'm just going to say an exponential amount. Uh, because prior to DBT, say I'm a data analyst, if I needed a new data set that I couldn't just throw together based on maybe the fact and dimension tables that I have access to, I would have to go to a data engineering team or a data management team to build that data set out for me. And then they build it and then it comes back to me, but that might take weeks, months sometimes, right? And the time to value to deliver this dashboard and like in the world of analytics, we're always time sensitive, or we should be at least, right? As an analyst, that was really difficult. And so Having DBT now, you have this advent of analytics engineering, and it kind of sits between data engineering and data analytics, or, or between the data analyst role and the data engineering role, right? Where you have you have this person that knows how to build dashboards, right? They're really good at the analytics side of things, the business facing side of the house. But if you can get them access to the raw data, they can use DBT to build out all those transformations that they need for their end use case, right? Whether that be a dashboard or some other data product out there. I think that the net, the net, you know, net, net, like the advent of analytics engineering has been very positive, right? And it's not just DBT that fits into there. I think this natural progression and DBT definitely helps in there, but there's just been this natural progression of uh, moving from a more traditional ETL ecosystem to ELT, right? Where we just get all the raw data into a, a landing zone and we then transform transform it on top, you know, after that point. Um, and DBT, of course, like makes that super easy, right? Because at the end of the day, DBT isn't doing any of the other mess. They're just, they're just there to help you transform the data. Yeah, maybe a bit of a controversial take from my end, but to me, the term analytics engineering, which has been around even before DBT, although not quite as mainstream as what it is now, to me, it, it's more of a marketing term. It's you're it's combining skill sets from a data analyst and a data engineer. But in my viewpoint, it's largely you're doing data engineering. Like you're still having someone build models. You're still having someone apply tests. You're still doing DevOps. But it has been a great term for the, the DBT community who I think has really rallied behind it. And usually if you see it now anywhere, regardless of whether marketing term or not, you pretty much know like, hey, DBT is going to have something to do with this role. So if you're going to search for, if you're like, I want to work for DBT and you're searching for jobs and you're looking for analysts, engineers, it's probably going to encompass some functionality from that. But I don't think it's necessarily a new role. I think it's a kind of just a term that's kind of coined to represent data analysts and data engineers of someone that's kind of combining different parts of those skill sets together. 
but I do think it is something that's around to stay. And I don't think it's a, I think it's a job that we're going to continue to see continue to pop up with organizations. Yeah. And I think, you know, to expand on that a little bit, I think for a long time that people have been doing this role, right? It maybe in the past, it was called the data warehouse developer, or data warehouse engineer, right? You weren't full blown in the data engineering perspective where you were building data integrations with say SaaS products or managing change data capture pipelines, things like that. Your, your entire job is to transform data in your warehouse and, and get it ready for whatever use cases you might have, right? And so it's just a natural progression of how things change over time. It's it's an existing role with a with a new title, and DBT has obviously helped shape that a lot, right? DBT as an organization, not as a tool, has helped shape the the term analytics engineering a lot. Data projects are notoriously complex, with multiple stakeholders to manage across varying backgrounds and tool chains. Even simple reports can become unwieldy to maintain. Miro is your single pane of glass where everyone can discover, track, and collaborate on your organization's data. I especially like the ability to combine your technical diagrams with data documentation and dependency mapping, allowing your data engineers and data consumers to communicate seamlessly about your projects. Find simplicity in your most complex projects with Miro. Your first three Miro boards are free when you sign up today at dataengineeringpodcast.com slash Miro. That's three free boards at dataengineeringpodcast.com slash M-I-R-O. And <clears throat> cycling back now to somebody who is using DBT, they're uh, building their data warehouse. As you mentioned, Dustin, one of the challenges of having these capabilities so easy to tap into is that maybe you move too fast for your own good. And I'm curious what you see as the challenges that people encounter as their DBT project begins to scale, where they've gone past the, oh, hey, I can build this one or maybe small handful of tables with DBT to I'm building an entire warehouse system using DBT. I've now got hundreds or thousands of tables, and I cannot figure out how to make this one small change that I need to make without bringing the whole house of cards crashing down. And so <laughs> I'm curious, what are some of those elements of technical debt that people are likely to experience? as they get further along in their journey of dbt yeah i think just as getting started and as you mentioned it's really it's a really easy tool to go and get started in you can go in and start building models and start producing and creating objects really really quickly and the fact that it's so easy just you just can just move so fast on it and when you have even in the realm of five to 10 people and they're building models for different purposes, like you can rack up hundreds of models really, really quickly. You end up with multiple versions of the same truth because one developer is building something and not paying attention to what another developer is building. You end up in needing to find something and not knowing exactly where to look. It can very quickly just become wild, wild west. I think for anyone who's getting started with DBT, I think you should stop before you even write your first piece of code in it. You should think about your plan. Like, how do I plan on using this? How do I plan on structuring this? How do I have governance in place to make sure that it doesn't become the wild, wild west? One of the things we've done in the role that I'm in currently is there's always going to be a need for reporting outside of data warehouse. Not every company needs a data warehouse. Sometimes you need a data warehouse. You need to build things in it. But you also need to be able to build operational reports. You need to keep, give the business the data that they need. Where there are two different needs. Um, one of the things we've done is we have two DBT projects that we run. One of them has our actual data warehouse in it, where we it's our data model. It's what we're working on. It's our single source of truth. And then we have another one that has our reporting items in it, some more of our operational reports, or things that haven't yet been built into a common model. So things that we just need to query against raw data and we need to produce a, produce a report, whether it's the sales, marketing, finance, product, whatever. Um, and they build those. And we have both of these projects are very structured. Like everyone on the team knows exactly what we're building here and they know where to put things of where they're building. They know where the dimensions and the facts live. Over in the reporting project, we have a lot of the projects structured really well in terms of our folder structure to know what goes where. So it's very easy for anyone, even if you've never worked with our DBT project at all, to come in and know, oh, this is what this is used for. This is what that's used for. Yes, you can look at the lineage and you can see how all of these things connect together, but it's very well structured. So everyone knows, you know, knows where things are. We didn't just take the product, hand it off to a bunch of data analysts and say, hey, here, go build, be merry, be happy. 
we started with a plan. And that's probably the biggest piece of advice I could give to anyone with DBT is have a plan for how you want to build things and how you want to structure things so you know what's happening. And then you can implement other best practices like code reviews and other things, et cetera, so that you're making sure you adhere to those standards. But you got to have a good plan getting started. Yeah, and I really like this idea of having two separate projects, right? You have your core model in one project where, you know, hey, the data warehouse, this is very tight controls on that, right? That's your data engineering team's going to own that. But I also like the idea of having that reporting project separate as well, you know, because that's at, at the end of the day, like that was the original use case that DBT was trying to solve was how can we bring these best practices to data analysts reporting and all of that stuff, right? And so having that project separate for them to still be able to take advantage of DBT, I think is super, super powerful because if you, if you say, no, we're not going to do that, we're going to be too strict with our project, you can't check in your your SQL queries for reporting. Well, when I say check in, check into source control. They're going to build that stuff anyway, right? So they're going to build all their ad hoc queries. And so they're just going to say they're going to they're going to be like me when I was a junior data analyst. And they're just going to be saving them on, your, on their laptop. So give them, empower them, right? Empower them with this reporting project like you're talking about, Dustin. I think there's some other things, though, that I could talk about as far as decisions to make a successful project, if that's is that a way we want to go. Yeah, one of the other things that I think helps set your project up for success, and this is the this is very much the engineer in me talking, but set up CI CD pipelines early on if you can, like early on in your establishment of DBT if you don't already have those set up. Uh, one mistake that I made when I first started using DBT was not doing that. And so I would push push changes out via Git, they would hit production. And models would start breaking because I missed I missed something, right? And so having CI checks in place to actually build those changed models before a pull request is ever allowed to even be merged into your main branch is of the utmost importance, right? Because at the end of the day, any stakeholders that use your models downstream, if you're pushing if you're putting bad things out, like you're gonna lose trust from them, right? And it's hard to rebuild that trust. And so having those CI C D checks in place are are of the utmost importance. The other one is a testing strategy, which also kind of plays in with that, but I love having a built-in testing strategy. And there's, there's this is twofold as well. Uh, the first one is data quality and like DBT makes that super easy, right? Adding you know, uniqueness tests to a column or a not null test relationship, so on and so forth. That stuff is very easy to do. It's very, it's also very easy to overdo, right? You could start putting a hundred tests on every single column in your in your tables and like it's going to slow your jobs down a lot but that's a whole separate conversation i think uh, the other one is unit testing and this in my opinion is so often overlooked in dbt projects and just in data engineering as a whole i think but yeah unit test your your code whenever you can and sql is inherently difficult to unit test right so i don't don't try to like unit test just for the sake of unit testing i guess the things that i would say is uh like say you have a big hairy case statement Try to unit test that, right? Make sure that your logic is doing exactly what you think it should be doing. Uh, macros is another one. If you're utilizing macros pretty frequently in your DBT project and you're doing some interesting business logic there as well, you might want to consider unit testing those. Fortunately, there's now packages in the DBT ecosystem that you can use to help you out with unit testing. Um, it's a little bit of work to get those set up, but I think it's immensely worth it once you actually have that have that rolling. And a couple of things that you mentioned earlier is the temptation to not use proper formal modeling techniques because it's so easy to just create a new table. Why do I need to do facts and dimensions until you've already gone down the road of I've got a dozen tables that I'll do mostly the same thing, whereas I could have just created those fact and dimension tables to begin with and saved myself a lot of headache. And then also that aspect of having reporting be something that is incorporated into the DBT flow instead of something that's bolted on after the fact. I'm wondering, what are some of the ways that you can help your teams train up on some of those formal modeling strategies and try to maybe incorporate some of those unit tests or linting into the project flow to be able to kind of help people fall into that pit of success of, I built my dimensional models because it was the easy thing to do. It made everything else easier for me. And then I can just build those six different views on those facts and dimensions as another layer of my DBT project. Yeah, so I'll share how I've approached it. So granted, I'm in an architect role, so I've designed a lot of these models before. The design starts before you actually get in and start writing code. So that means 
really sitting down thinking about your data, building some ERDs, building some source to target mapping documents to figure out, okay, or actually even before that, let me even go back even prior to that. Like understanding your business need is the first thing before you even start putting together technical requirements down the paper, meeting with your stakeholders, understanding what their needs are and documenting that out and then taking that and converting that into a data model that can service those needs. So most of the warehouses that I've built, um, and I know different people have differing opinions on this, have been dimensional models. I'm not diehard dimensional model everything. There's different models that meet different use cases. But in the, in the stuff that I've built has predominantly dimensional models have worked extremely well. But taking those business requirements, laying down a model or having someone on your team create that model of, okay, here's what my dimensions look like. Here's what my facts look like. Vetting that, having the team review it, like, does this accomplish our needs? Because effectively what you're trying to do in a dimensional model is you're trying to create with your dimension, you're trying to create master data tables. You're trying to create single places to look at stuff. And with your fact tables, you're creating what you're trying to measure. But you need to think through those things beforehand, because when I've gone through model design before, I'll start with something and then three weeks later, it looks completely different. Not that it always takes that long, but you start thinking through things, thinking through it. And I'm not saying that everyone has to go through a full exercise of you spend weeks and weeks trying to figure out your model, but you do need to at least put thought into it before you get started. And you need to have a plan of what you plan to do. And does that plan change? Absolutely. As you get in, you start writing code can absolutely change, but you need a plan to start with. If this is this is our North Star, this is what we are working toward, this is what we're trying to build, and these are the business needs we're trying to accomplish before you ever even get into your project and start writing code. And where I think a lot of people fail is, it's like, oh, we have DBT now, we can write SQL and we can do this stuff really easy. Let's just go in and start building stuff. And then it becomes chaos really, really quickly. Yeah, and I think all of that actually helps improve the developer experience as well, right? If you, as you continue to scale your project your, and your organization, you're going to have, you just naturally are going to have more engineers that are working on your team. Um, and so if you have some level of standard modeling practice in place, it's going to be easier for them to come in and start building out new models in DBT. This gets a little confusing when we start talking about it like this. It's like we're talking about the data model itself and then the actual activity of building the model when we're referring it to DBT. But yeah, from the developer experience, it makes it a lot, a lot easier and a lot smoother as well. And so as you are building out a DBT project, you're building out a team to work on it. What are some of the tools or processes, whether inside or outside of DBT, that can help alleviate the incidental complexity of working on a large data project, whether it's a data warehouse or reporting or some other application of these technologies? Yeah, one is, you know, just in being intentional about writing the documentation for all your models, right? go in, write the documentation, because as everything continues to grow, it's going to be much easier for a new developer to come in and get up to speed quickly on what's actually happening in there. I've come into DBT projects where there were 15 engineers working on it and there was no documentation written. And so the best thing that I could do is like load the visual DAG and try to understand how everything connected, which is great, but it doesn't give me any context about why the things are doing what they're doing, right? The DAG tells you what is happening, but it doesn't at all tell you why it is happening. Yeah, being intentional about writing that documentation. This goes back to how I was talking earlier. Like, if you're good at this, you're going to live in YAML a lot, but it pays dividends in the end. Yeah, the documentation is a good one. Just kind of in general, some things that I think that will help your project be successful. We've kind of hit on this one a lot, working from a plan. Another one is making sure like you have good like push processes in place. Um, so if you have any sort of standards that you're working against, make sure there's a way to be able to check those. So for an example of when you push to get, making sure there's a code review process so people just aren't able just to push push anything that they want, that there's some sort of review that makes sure it adheres to a standards. And then just generally working collaboratively with each, with each other, like DBT is pretty easy to work collaborative on, but it's easy just to kind of go rogue and start building things. So just making sure you're having good communication with other folks on your team as you work through things. And then lastly, that I'll mention here is just monitoring your builds. So you can build models currently and they may only take X amount of time to run, but as you continue to add more and more and more to it, of just keep an eye on those things. DBT, if you're using cloud, has some decent monitoring capabilities. 
um, to be able to check to see how how long things are running and then tracking those over time just to see like, hey, am I going the wrong direction? Are my models taking longer? Did something, did somebody change something that had a big impact on it, et cetera? Yeah, there's definitely tools outside of DBT that help make this all of these things possible, right? So we've hit on CI, CD quite a bit. You know, at the end of the day, you have to have some tool to help you do that. And I personally like GitHub Actions. It just it just works. I work in GitHub already anyway. Uh, but, you know, I've seen teams use Jenkins, Circle CI. You can use DBT Cloud to help you with your CI processes as well, right? I mean, they have, they have a neat little, uh, neat little add-in for GitHub. But all of that, like, definitely you want to have those additional products to help make sure you're your uh, CICD pipelines are running very smoothly. And Dustin, you also just hit on the data observability piece more, you know, I think that's what you're getting at is you want to notice, you know, say you have a, a fact orders model that gets built every day. If there becomes some discrepancy in the row counts or uh, some column suddenly becomes skewed in the average, right? You want to be aware of that. DBT will help you, you know, at least DBT Cloud will help you know when things are failing, but it there's other tools out there that you can use, like Metaplane is one that comes to mind immediately for me that you can use to monitor the actual values in your tables and get alerted when things go wrong, right? So it's very similar to like Datadog for an application, but you know, it just helps you understand uh, when things are maybe that wouldn't might slide under the radar, you get you get alerted of those, which I think is great, right? I'm, I'm a big Slack advocate. And so if I can just get pinged in Slack that something's going on, like that makes my life a whole lot easier. Yeah. Uh, one of the other challenges that I've experienced with working with DBT, and it touches on that question of CICD, is how do you actually have a proper QA environment? Is it just a different schema in your production data warehouse? Do you actually have a QA data warehouse where QA where data from QA systems flows in and that's where you test things? Like, how do you do it? <laughs> that's kind of the uh, overarching question that the entire data engineering community is trying to grapple with right now, I think. That is a great question. And I think it a lot of it boils down to which platform you're using, uh, meaning like which data platform you're using, right? So you're using Snowflake, Databricks, BigQuery, what have you. I can speak from it very well from the Snowflake perspective, and it's how I've done it. So when we talk about CI, CD, right, and we, we want to run our models when pull requests get opened up, we obviously don't want that to run in production because if something's wrong, the entire idea here is so that it doesn't break up the production data sets. Uh, what I've done currently is using Snowflake's uh, database copy commands. So copy the entire production database as a new database. I also tag that database, not tag, I name that database. I include the PR number in that database somewhere so that if you have like two CI jobs running at once, they're not stepping on each other's toes. And so you can have scales out pretty well, right? You can have a bunch of developers opening pull requests at the same time, but then everything runs in there. And then if something fails, like it's just in this isolated environment, there's no worry that uh, we broke dev, we broke prod, like you broke the CI database. That's totally fine. That's why it's there. And we're going to drop that database once the job is completed anyway. So it doesn't really matter. There's ways, there's other ways that you can do it, like, or I guess platforms that don't have that copy command, right? Um, I've seen some other folks run it in an isolated schema. If you, you can do that in production and then you run it in an isolated schema and then use like custom schemas and DBT to like build everything in that one schema. That's a, it's a nifty way to do it. But then again, you're still running it in your production database. And while you can probably manage permissions to not expose it, it's less ideal to me, at least than having it in a, a completely isolated environment. That's something that I favor a lot. Yeah. I've got a very similar setup to what Cameron is doing. The The feature in Snowflake is zero copy clone, where it'll take a clone of the database. It doesn't copy the entire database. So if you have a really large database, you're like, oh, this can take forever for it to take copy. It only copies the metadata over. Um, so it's really, really fast. And then yeah, you run your, your CI checks against it. It runs a full build against it and tells you if there's any errors. And we actually have our promotion process is actually set up that it has to pass that CI job before you can actually complete a merge. So if it doesn't pass, you've got to go in and fix it and you never taint data between your upstream environments. We are running a dev, a QA, and a prod. I've seen people run more environments than this. On Snowflake, it's really easy to use the same instance of Snowflake to set up each one of your environments because you can 
separate those based on how you create your warehouses. So you're not sharing compute between environments, as well as using RBAC to set up roles that can access different environments. So from a user perspective, it looks like I'm only looking at dev, I'm only looking at QA, I'm only looking at prod. When you look at those, and that's how I've done it, but as Cameron mentioned, it's going to vary depending on what your data store is that you're using. A lot of these are going to have some some similar sorts of functionalities to be able to make it work, but I've had great success with, with doing exactly what he described and it's worked worked phenomenal. Yeah, I think your your setup of an environments also depends on how you structure your release cycles. So if you're doing so you have some sort of release cadence where everything gets merged into a like a, a release branch in GitHub and then you actually release it to production once a week, that might change the way you think about this stuff. You might really want to have a dedicated QA environment at that point, uh, in addition to the CI environment. But for me, I don't I do not do that right now. Like I don't have a dedicated release cycle. The way we have it set up is everything, once it runs in CI, you can release things to production immediately, right? And the developers have full control over production releases. And so it, yeah, that I think that plays a big factor into whether or not you would want a QA environment isolated or not. And then you have to make the decision of uh, do I run my CEI stuff in the QA environment or not? That's a that's another question to ask as well. And as you have been building with DBT in your own work, the work that you've done to write this book and publish it and the work that you're doing in your local communities, what are some of the most interesting or innovative or unexpected ways that you've seen DBT used? Yeah, I've got a I've got a pretty cool one. I don't know that it's extremely complex, but I, I it's a nifty little trick that I have. And so I quite frequently use incremental models so that we're not, you know, loading data a hundred times a week or something, right? Like just load the data we need to load. But things go wrong when you're loading incremental models. Like it, it's bound to happen. And so anybody that's worked in the data space, especially in data engineering, is very familiar with backfills, I'm sure. And so a unique use case, I suppose, that I've had is using a, a macro to override whatever date you're using for your incremental loads, right? So in a in an incremental model in DBT, a very common pattern is to have a where clause that filters your select statement by some date and or timestamp. And so what I've done is wrap that date field in a in a macro that allows you to pass in a static variable whenever you run the dbt project and so you you know run your dbt build command you can pass in a variable so say you want to backload or i'm sorry backfill for the past two weeks you can actually pass in a static date that way instead of trying to do like a full refresh and i think that that improves performance significantly when you're talking about backfills because without that dbt of course has the full refresh flag but like if you've been building this incremental table for three years like just because one thing went wrong this week, does it make sense to really build rebuild three years worth of data? Probably not. So having that macro that allows you to override whatever your incremental date is, I think is extremely valuable in, in terms of performance and just getting backfills out faster. Yeah, from my perspective, I'd, I was trying to think if there was any sort of like interesting, there's lots of interesting things like d- being done in DBT, but it's still part of its sort of core competency. One thing I'll add though is, with hooks, pretty much anything is possible within DBT. So whether you run a pre-hook or a post-hook, and I've seen some pretty creative ways that those have been used to be able to, yeah, you can literally do anything before and or after using hooks. Um, it's not necessarily always a good idea to do. Usually hooks are like a last option. Like I just don't have another way to be able to do this and I need, I just want it to be part of my DBT build. But that's the only other one that I can think of where People can get pretty creative with those, but you can also do things you probably shouldn't do. Yeah, I mean, going on the the topic of hooks, like I've seen, I've seen people use hooks to manage uh, access controls on their objects in their database, right? Or uh, I've also seen them use it to like vac, like run the vacuum command on their tables in BigQuery. And I think DBT now has some, you know, they have some built-in capabilities for this stuff, right? And so that's another thing is just to with regards to hooks. And we do talk about this in the book. There's a whole chapter dedicated to hooks, but we do caution you like time and time again is to make sure that when you use hooks, don't get into this, don't get into anti-patterns, right? Make sure that DBT for sure doesn't have a feature for whatever you're trying to do before you start using hooks, right? So if you're using, if you're using hooks to like 
create a temporary table before you build a model, certainly an anti-pattern. Like you should just break that out into a separate model and then reference it downstream. And um, But yeah, I've seen some very creative use of hooks as well. And more often than not, it seems like they're anti-patterns and there's probably better ways to do them. Yeah, we have an example in my current role where we, we use the post hook to do access controls where we have a model that's getting built that we're then sharing with an external customer. So we're using data sharing capability in Snowflake. And when you use table and view materializations within dbt it does a drop and a recreate every time you run those and so as a result any permissions that you have on that object then get dropped so we had a post hook that would run that would add those permissions back but it actually wasn't very good design because we just needed to switch that to an incremental model so the table didn't get dropped and the permissions persisted so kind of back to what cameron was saying in terms of anti-patterns like a lot of times there's a better way to be able to do it without having to do that but they are there if you need them yeah, for sure. And I mean, this is a this is more of a personal preference or rant, if you will. But I've made the conscious decision to pull, you know, access controls out of my DBT projects. I, there was a time where I was managing them as post hooks on all of my on all of my models, and I realized this is a bad idea. And I was working with Snowflake at the time, and Snowflake has a, there's a Terraform provider that you can use, and so much easier. And it like that's what it's designed for, right? Versus trying to put the the square peg in the round hole kind of thing, right? And DBT, I don't know if it's a recent feature, but they actually have the grants capability as a config you can put on the model as well. Yep. Yeah, but as we found out, grants don't work with data sharing. They only work with, with access. So Fair enough. As you continue to build with DBT and you uh, keep track of its continued evolution and you continue to think towards what does that next version of the book look like, what are the things that are on your personal wish list for the future of DBT? So for me, I had a, a pretty good personal wish list a couple months ago, and they actually like have satisfied them. So my my wish list has gone down a lot, but I'll 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 plug the things anyway. The first one would have been support, at least from the the cloud perspective, right? DBT Cloud would have been support for micro the Microsoft platform. That like for a long time now, I had just a really hard time understanding why. DBT wasn't supporting the Microsoft platform. I mean, so many companies use Microsoft, but with the announcement of uh, Microsoft Fabric, they now support Fabrics and Apps Analytics. So I think that's a that's a great win for them and something that I'm interested in trying out as well. And the other things would have been materialized view support for Snowflake. That's been on my wish list for quite literally years. And it just, it just came out, I believe, in the last release of DBT. Now I can support materialized views in my DBT project, which... A huge win, right? I mean, there's so often times where I don't want to build a table, but a view just doesn't cut it because it, it's not quite performant enough for my end user. So being able to have those in there is, is great. So I guess the holidays came a little bit early for me this year on my on my DBT wish list. Yeah, a few things for my end, and these are more so focused toward the cloud. Um, I think having the having better ability to be able to profile data from within DBT cloud is something that I'm interested in seeing. Right now, when I do a lot of development, I find myself developing, like if I'm using Snow, Snowflake, I'll develop more in SnowSight, and then I'll convert what I've built over into DBT, so I'm not just completely working through the DBT Cloud IDE. So having more to be able to like go in and profile data, understanding like where I'm missing data or number of distinct values, et cetera, because a lot of times I'm working with data, and maybe as I'm building transformations, it's really the first time that I've really kind of dove into it. Having more capabilities within cloud, I think, is going to be great. I've talked to a lot of people who, and granted, they're data engineers who love command line, but they're not big fans of the IDE. So I think continuing to see see that get built out. Unit test is one that I've heard. There's a way to do unit test in, in DBT, but I think continuing to build that out and provide more, more functionality. And then the last one, which I've I'm kind of interested to see how this evolves is to see how DBT incorporates more AI into their product. And if they're going to do this, particularly around like doing like evaluating code and co doing code quality and having checks against that. We talked about a lot of the issues when you give, when you give this tool over to analysts um, and they're just going wild writing stuff. Like, is there some sort of mechanism where we could utilize AI to basically evaluate code and catch stuff that we would maybe have people doing during code reviews um, would be something that I'd love to see as well. So Dustin, you're kind of thinking like a like a GitHub co-pilot, but in DBT Cloud, yeah? 
That'd be yeah, pretty absolutely. Sweet. Yeah, because I mean, it would have all the context of exactly what DBT syntax you know needs to be. So that would be would be pretty interesting. I guess one other thing for me too, now that we we talked about it earlier on the call, Tobias, but you mentioned column level lineage, and yeah, that for a long time now, I feel like is something that DBT has lacked in its uh, in its presentation. And it feels like they have they have all the metadata available to them, right? Like everything they would need to build a feature out around column level lineage. I don't spend all that time in those YAML files for nothing, right? So they could use it to, to help me understand column level lineage a little bit better. Absolutely. Oh, well, are there any other aspects of your work with DBT in your jobs, your work on the book, your investment in the community through your sharing of knowledge that we didn't discuss yet that you'd like to cover before we close out the show? So yeah, one thing. So obviously we have the book that's out now and we would love to get that in as many hands of folks as we can. We spent a, a tremendous amount of time writing this. It took us a year to write and hundreds of hours. So we'd love to get that out to folks. Um, both myself and Cameron were also very active within the data community. Um, we presented at conferences around the world. And if you ever get a chance to come see us or talk to us, feel free to stop us. We also, within the Nashville community, we run the Nashville Data Engineering Group, which is just an opportunity for us to get together with other local data engineers, hear about new products, new topics, learn from others. Um, we think we're pretty smart, but we know we still have a whole lot to learn. So being having the opportunity to learn from others. And then we've actually launched a new conference that we have coming up that is going to be in March of 2024. It's going to be hosted in downtown Nashville, where we have multiple tracks around data technology that's going to be happening. We have a data engineering track, uh, data analytics, data science, and data management. Um, it's going to be a two-day conference. We have workshops one day, general confer conference, more so conference-style sessions the next. Um, around all of these topics. Um, we've got, we're going to be talking DBT, we're going to be talking Snowflake, we're going to be talking Databricks, we're going to be talking a whole bunch of dis different stuff during that conference. We'd love to have folks come and join us. Um, if you're interested in speaking, um, you can go to datatuneconf.com and you can check out what it is to submit to speak and all the different benefits that come with that. But our speaker submission is open until the end of this month. So it will close on November 30th. And then we will make selections shortly after that. So you have plenty of time to know if you're from out of town and want to come in. But Nashville is a beautiful city. It's a lot of fun. Um, would love to have folks come and join us. And one thing I want to hit on the conference as well, and that I, I like to publicize everywhere I can, is how often do you go to a conference and it's just simply out of reach because it's so expensive? We have intentionally made it very, very affordable for practitioners to come and hang out, right? Like we are not marketing this conference necessarily from the attendee perspective of like sales or business folks entirely. Like we want pr practitioners there and we, we want everybody there, but we want it to be affordable, right? And just to come to the general sessions, um, it's $25, which I mean, you, you both know the, the price of conference tickets, like $25 is absolutely insane. The pre-conference workshops range anywhere from 150 to 200, depending on which one you choose and you know, when you buy the tickets. But even that, I mean, $200 for a full day workshop is still cheaper than just admittance to most conferences. So just wanted to plug that as well. Definitely worth it. If you're going to be in the Nashville area, buy a ticket, come hang out. It's going to be a great time. Yeah, we also aren't trying to push any initiative. So you're not going to hear 50 sessions by our partners trying to sell you something. Like we are technologists at the end of the day. We just want to learn. So everything that we are putting on the docket is about learning technology. So there's no sales marketing initiatives. No no vendor is, is running this event. This is literally a group of local community leaders who got together and said, hey, we want to, we want to put together a tech event and we want to learn. All right. For anybody who wants to get in touch with either of you and follow along with the work that you're doing, I will add your preferred contact information to the show notes. I'll also add links to the conference and the speaker submissions uh, for anybody who wants to get involved there. And so as the final question, I'd like to get your perspectives on what you see as being the biggest gap in the tooling or technology that's available for data management today. Yeah, I'll start here. So for me, it boils down to security. So I think especially as you continue to see things evolve, um, data privacy, security, compliance, these things all continue to be big concerns. Data is increasing in volume, it's increasing in sensitivity. And so us continuing to ensure it is safe and protected is going to be huge. With some of the rapid adoption, especially of like AI and ML, it raises a lot of questions around ethical 
uses of data. So having more robust governance frameworks is something that I think is going to be really, really critical. So I know we didn't talk about security too much during um, during the talk, but it is something that I think is going to be extremely, extremely important as we move forward and we have all of these new technologies popping up. Yeah, and then for me, the the gap that I see is the biggest one today is you know the this concept of data contracts. Like it's becoming more popular, and as a data engineer, I want to make sure that my pipelines are trustworthy and that any upstream changes that you know might happen in like my company's application don't break my data pipelines. And while there's ways that you can go out and implement them today yourselves, like it's interesting to see there's there's a few new companies that are coming out. I can't think of them exactly by name right now, but there's a few companies coming out that are going to be offering the SaaS product for you to implement data contracts that you can build into your CI workflows for your for your product engineers and your software engineers upstream so that, hey, like we've agreed that this is our contract. This is what we expect the data to be downstream. And if you're going to change it, like it needs to get added to added to the contract so that it doesn't break things downstream. Because like, yeah, as a, as a data engineer, it's just horrible when you get a notification at two o'clock in the morning because something broke. And it was completely out of your control. All right. Well, thank you very, uh, thank you both very much for taking the time today to join me and share your experiences working with DBT as practitioners and on writing the book to help other people level up in their practice of DBT. So appreciate all the time and energy that you've both put into that. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you, Tobias. Thanks, Tobias. Have a good one. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to check out our other shows, podcast.init, which covers the Python language, its community, and the innovative ways it is being used, and the Machine Learning Podcast, which helps you go from idea to production with machine learning. Visit the site at dataengineeringpodcast.com to subscribe to the show, sign up for the mailing list, and read the show notes. And if you've learned something or tried out a project from the show, then tell us about it. Email hosts at dataengineeringpodcast.com with your story. And to help other people find the show, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts and tell your friends and coworkers.